Let me take a moment, if I can, to introduce our very esteemed panel to you. And we always appreciate the fact that people travel many, many miles to come and be with us and to share their various perspectives. And for some of you, this will be a first-time introduction to some of our panels. Let me start with Brandon Robertson, if I can. Brandon is a millennial. That's probably a self-evident truth. He's an activist. He's an author. He's the founder of the Revangelical Movement. And he's also the national spokesperson for Evangelicals for Marriage Equality. Dr. Michael Brown is the founder of the FIRE School of Ministry. He has his own radio program. He has his own television program. He's an author and he's a scholar. And we welcome him today. Justin Lee is the founder of the Gay Christian Network. And uh, in the words of that organization, they want to build a welcoming community for gay Christians. Ann Polk speaks all over the country on issues of sexual healing. She's an author as well. And she is the founder and executive director of the Restored Hope Network, which is a coalition of ministries working to help people who are struggling with same-sex attraction. Would you welcome our panelists, please? Friends, I thank you so much for being here, and I want to start out with some basics, and I want to slay some mythological dragons as we start. <laughs> so let's start first with what this is not about. And I'm going to ask a broad question, and anybody disagrees, you jump in, because this is a conversation, not crossfire. So let me point that out. All right, so let me start with the basics. Is anyone on this panel saying that we are opposed to someone who deals with the issue of same-sex attraction from attending an evangelical Bible-believing church? Absolutely not. All in agreement. All in agreement. Common yeah. ground, note, maybe the only time, but I want you to know this. <laughs> okay, so we're in agreement of that, number one. Number two, and this is where it's going to be interesting because this is about a war of words in some respects. Brandon, for example, you have a working definition of what the word evangelical means, and it might be different for me. So for the benefit of this group, let me put on the table that for our conversation, it will be a Bible-believing, Christ-affirming uh, church that believes in salvation by grace through faith because of Jesus Christ. Now, we understand that even the word evangelical is in the process of evolving, but for this conversation, may I say also, so not to offend, that it takes a long time to say LGBTQ and whatever else you want to add to it, so I may juxtaposition those words with the word gay, but it means the same thing, and it is never meant to be a pejorative. Acceptable? Absolutely. Yep. Good. Uh, one, one thing I'd clarify on that. Uh, being an evangelical would, is moral and credo. In, yes. other, in other words, it's not simply a matter of I believe this, but I also believe in a certain moral standard. So I would say that if we want to be evangelical in, in the historic sense that it's been used for decades now, we're not just talking about believing in biblical fundamentals, but also affirming biblical morality. Uh, so that, that is obviously going to be an issue that, that we can work on and clarify as we go on. Absolutely. All right, let's start with this, because we could go to the issue of so-called gay marriage, but in many respects, that's the tail on the dog. I'd rather start at the beginning of the conversation. And to start at the beginning of the conversation, it is necessary that we start with the Word of God. So let me just ask some broad questions, and if anybody disagrees, weigh in. Do all four of you believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God? Yes. Absolutely. Sure is that. Justin. Yeah, yes, although <clears throat> I like to say, as, as Tony Campolo uh, puts it, we may have an inerrant word, but we do not have inerrant interpreters. So I always, when people ask me, is the Bible inerrant, I always put that little caveat on there because I absolutely uh, trust the Bible, but I also know that when I read the Bible, I have to be aware that I'm fallible and I may read it incorrectly. Michael, I'm going to have you respond to that, but let me do a follow-up question, if I may. So who does the interpreting? Well, I believe that we ought to allow the Holy Spirit to interpret, um, but uh, I also know that, again, as human beings, we, you know, I can say, well, I'm letting the Holy Spirit interpret, and this is what the Holy Spirit uh, told me, and yet I've, in many situations, not just on this question, but in many questions on Christian doctrine, we often have two brothers or sisters in Christ who both say, I'm letting the Holy Spirit interpret, and this is what the uh, Holy Spirit is telling me that the Word says, and they come to different conclusions. That doesn't mean they're both right. All right. Follow up again, and then, Michael, I want you to weigh in. So on the biggies, not the minors, but on the biggies, if God is not the author of confusion, would the Holy Spirit tell you one thing and Michael another thing? No, I don't think so. I think if we, if we come to different conclusions, then it's because one or both of us got it wrong somewhere. Okay. Michael. 
on the one hand, of course, I agree with what Justin is saying, that the very fact that we have differences within NRB, within any group, within denominations, that we have denominations indicates that we don't have perfect interpretation. But if we do not believe that God could speak clearly, let's say we're the Israelites at Mount Sinai and say, yeah, God did speak plainly, don't steal, don't commit adultery, but what does that really mean? Uh, that's always the danger. Hath God really said the old lie from the garden? So we need to come with a posture. You're God. We are your creation. And as followers of Jesus, whatever you want, whatever you say, we want to pursue it. And therefore, as interpreters, we have to do everything we can to work against what our biases, what our own perceptions would be, and humble ourselves before the word, which is living and active, which, is, which does lay, lay every heart bare. And uh, w without jumping ahead, what I have seen happen consistently in the, quote, gay Christian debate is people saying, well, the biblical author just didn't understand that. Well, Jesus d didn't really see that. The moment I hear that, or the moment I see interpretations that never existed before the sexual revolution in the history of biblical interpretation, despite liberals and radicals and agnostics reading it, I say, there's, there's an obvious question here. So I always have to ask myself, am I interpreting the Bible through the lens of my perceptions, or am I allowing the Bible to interpret who I am? And, and if we can all start there in humility before God and follow God's word wherever it lies, then, then it's a place of safety. Brandon, let me go to you on that. Yeah. And then, Anna, I saw your hand go up, so I want to bring you in this as well. So on a follow-up to what Michael said, so do we interpret culture through scripture or scripture through culture? We absolutely have to interpret the culture through the lens of scripture. I would totally agree with that and affirm that. But back to kind of what Justin said, I do believe that there is a real sense that the church has gotten things wrong throughout the history of the church. And as we've done that, the Holy Spirit's done his convicting work and brought us forward into a correct standing. And you know all of the um, areas that I could bring up on slavery, on women's issues. Um, the Holy Spirit's done a convicting work in calling his church forward. And I think we need to be open to that as well but also keeping the Word of God the central place for our Christian life and faith. And I know you're going to follow up, but I, you, you, it didn't take us long to get into slavery, so you yeah. open that door, let me go there. Yeah. <laughs> so you painted with a very broad brush. You yeah. said the church, but the abolitionist movement was started by the church. Yeah. So wouldn't it be far more accurate to say some in the church misinterpreted the passages of Scripture? I think we could say the majority of the church did, and then those people, the abolitionist movement, were people who listened to the Holy Spirit and believed that the Word of God was living and active, and that Christ still speaks to us today, and they heard God's call to repent of the sin of racism and segregation, and that's what led us forward into where we are today, where no church would affirm slavery. Yeah, that, that's quite an interesting reading of church history. Yeah. I mean, the, the Bible has been a book of liberation for women, for example, through history. Sure. It's been a book of liberation in many places for slaves through history. It's, in a, it's been a book bringing equality through history. So yeah, the church has been blemished, but th that again is the fundamental difference. To say that you have to say that the entire church yeah, yeah. through all of history has been wrong about something as fundamental and important as two men or two women. So throughout history, we know there were people same-sex attracted. It's attested in, in all these sure. different cultures. The biblical authors were around that they saw it, and yet they got it wrong, and the church got it wrong. Again, that's, that's why we start with saying something is now imposing a view on Scripture post-sexual revolution that nobody ever dreamed of before, and the whole church got wrong. And, and, and now I'm 20 or I'm 60 or I'm 80, I figured it out. That, that's basically where error comes in immediately. I mean, that's almost one of the, the large signs, cult, error, deception, that we start there. And then you must come with overwhelming scriptural evidence to the contrary uh, to, to even, even get us to consider that possibility, whereas the overwhelming evidence, as I believe we'll see during our conversation, is completely against the position that you brought up. Absolutely. Sure. And well, I would just say that the Holy Spirit interpreting, but also Scripture interpreting Scripture, I think that that would be the critical part to start in as well, because people can claim the Holy Spirit said this, that, or the other, and reinterpret Scripture according to whatever their viewpoint is. But if we take the whole counsel of God and put that together and examine the underlying bedrock belief of scripture, I think that we have a much more full picture of what, what God intends for human sexuality. Yeah. 
period. What a segue. So let me go to scripture. And, and I know that in deference to time, it would be easy to just give the mailing address of the verse, but I'm going to read the verse because I think that's really what's in the dock in our conversation. So I want to start in Genesis. Genesis 2:18. the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So Justin and, and Brandon, let me start with you. Can an argument be made that a suitable helper could be a person of the same sex? Um, <clears throat> well, yes, that argument could be made. Uh, let me say a couple things, though. Uh, first, I, I want to be clear that uh, my, my uh, reason for being on this panel uh, is not to make an argument about what the Bible says regarding same-sex sexual relationships. Um, you know, the, one of the reasons I was asked here was, was to be here and talk about church policy with regard to LGBT people. How do we treat LGBT people? And the organization that I run, although I can understand why people might think from the name Gay Christian Network uh, that we are an organization advocating uh, for a particular position on uh, you know, the morality of same-sex relationships. We are actually an organization of Christians who disagree with one another on questions like that. So some of our members would say, yes, absolutely, when God says it's not good for the man to be alone, that means that some people, a same-sex partner is gonna be the right person. Others would say, no, absolutely not. Uh, God's design is male and female, and if your only attractions are for the same sex, and that doesn't change, then you need to be celibate. Uh, where we agree is that uh, Christians have frequently, in many cases, uh, across many denominations and churches, not known how to respond with love and grace and compassion to the person in the congregation who says, uh, I think I'm gay, meaning not I'm taking on an identity or I'm planning to uh, act in a particular way sexually, right. but I'm attracted exclusively to the same sex. And so that's kind of, you know, I, wa I want to make sure that I don't pigeonhole myself in trying to make an argument about the Bible and sexual morality because it's not really, you know, why I'm here. But you did say that you talked about policy in the church. Yes. So the presupposition in that statement is policy is predicated on the word of God. So otherwise it's man just making it up as he goes along. So you've made your position clear, but Brandon, let me sure. go to you. And I, what about the suitable helper? This is an argument that Matthew Vines makes yeah, as an absolutely. example. And I would say the same thing first of all. I want to say that I'm 22 years old with a Bible college degree, and so I'm not going to be so arrogant to come here and think that I could debate Dr. Michael Brown on what the Bible says about homosexuality. But what I do want to affirm is that in the church there is significant disagreement about this issue rising up in our generation, in particular millennials. And we need to figure out what we can do. Is this a salvation issue? Is this a gospel issue? Is this a dividing issue? That's really where my passion in this lies, is to say, on that verse we might have disagreement about what the scripture is actually speaking about. Right. But at the end of the day, no matter what we believe, God's grace is going to cover us in the end. And that's kind of the position I'm trying to advocate for. All right, so let me, as a follow up then, Michael, I want you to respond, please. Is this a salvation issue? Is this a gospel issue? Me? Uh, no, I absolutely don't think it is because there are so many areas in church, in church theology where we disagree on what the Bible says. One area, for instance, is there are a majority of people, a lot of people here at the conference who would identify as charismatic, but somebody like Dr. John MacArthur says the charismatic movement is the biggest heresy of modern day, uh, in the modern day church. Well, who's here going to say that Dr. Michael Brown's not a Christian because he's a charismatic? No one. And yet, if we went with Dr. Uh, John MacArthur's argument, then if somebody's speaking in tongues or anything like that, they're not doing that move by the Holy Spirit, so they're living in sin. Well, we would not say that Dr. Michael Brown's not a Christian or that Dr. John MacArthur's not a Christian. And so, similarly, on this issue, there is a divergence of views that are rising up in the church, and I want to advocate that the blood of Christ covers us all. And so, if I turn out to be wrong on my view about sexuality, I have faith that on the judgment day, I'm going to be relying on the cross of Christ, and that God is going to cover me if I was wrong. And likewise, if the non-affirming side is wrong, God will cover us on the judgment day for that. But, but Michael, before you respond, because I appreciate the sentiment of that, but I question its authenticity. Sure. You said it when you stand individually, what happens when you're part of a movement that yeah. promulgates, which in the final analysis could be dead wrong? Then what? Well, the same question goes for what happens to the charismatic movement or the cessationist movement. On judgment day, somebody is going to be wrong, but we wouldn't say that. We would say that Christ's blood is strong enough to cover our wrongness in that. Michael. Yeah, so just to affirm first, I'm 100% with Justin to say we must 
have a more compassion and understanding for those who say I'm same-sex attracted or whoever else they identify. I want to stand with him side by side in doing that. And I appreciate that Brandon and Justin are not here to debate scripture. I do want to say clearly, though, that the, John MacArthur considers me a brother and I consider him a brother. Nowhere does the scripture warn that if you speak in tongues or if you don't speak in tongues, you will not inherit the kingdom. However, Paul is categorical in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 that if someone is a persistent adulterer, if someone is persistently sexual immoral, if someone is persistently practicing homosexuality, they will not inherit the kingdom. So the word tells us plainly it's a salvation issue because it's a lifestyle issue and Jesus does not simply save us in our sin but from our sin. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father. As James Edmund Orr once said, the only proof of the new birth is the new life. So back to Genesis 2. No, it's impossible that two men or two women could provide the suitable helper thing for each other. Beginning in Genesis 1, when God creates in 26, 27, it is male and female he creates. And then he says, be fruitful and multiply. So this is a fundamental mission of Adam, of humanity that he creates. The man is now alone. It doesn't say that it's not good to be alone. He needs a suitable companion, but a suitable helper. Very important text to, to uh, difference to note. So what does that mean? He needed help in the garden. It was a big garden. No, he cannot fulfill his mission as male without a female because genetically and generically, we cannot reproduce unless we are male and female. So the suitable helper that Adam needed was not only a companion. Now, why didn't God make Adam and Adam? Two identicals, both with seed and egg, because there was complementarity. So notice what happens. It is the, the woman is taken from the man. She's called Isha in Hebrew because she's taken from the Ish. And then he says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The two come together. Only male and female can come together as one. Male plus male or female plus female or in, in, in the words of the, the best-selling books, Mars plus Mars, Venus plus Venus does not equal male plus female, Mars plus Venus. Only those two have the biological complement emotional, etc., everything else, and, and throughout Scripture. Here's what's interesting. Every single reference to marriage to family from beginning to end is heterosexual only. It is presupposed, every parable, every teaching, it is only male, female. Husbands love your wives, wives love your husbands. If you have two men, two women, who's the wife, who's the husband? I don't say that to demean, I simply say it's not addressing that. Uh, honor your father and mother. Who's the father? Who's the mother? This is what's presupposed. Every parable, every teaching, every illustration, every law, in, in contradiction, there's not a single positive reference to homosexual practice anywhere in the Bible. There's not a single reference, positive reference to a homosexual relationship. Every reference to homosexuality is condemned, or homosexual practice is condemned in the strongest possible terms. So from beginning to end, only one thing is presupposed, one thing is taught, one thing is laid out, and even biological design, natural law, it tells us what God put together. So impossible for another male uh, to fulfill that role of being suitable helper, or if it was for Eve and Eve, another woman could not be. And, and in, in Matthew 19, when Jesus is answering the Pharisees about divorce, um, he reflects back to Genesis, the very point of design. Um, man and woman were made for each other to be suitable helpers. And so it's an interesting thing that uh, Leviticus, Genesis 2, Genesis 1, um, Matthew 19, Mark 10, um, and on and on we go. The reaffirmation of male and female as suitable helper to one another as, as the joining of two into one. I mean, it's, it's no longer one person whom God hath joined together. Let no man separate. So Justin, let me come back to you if I can, because this really isn't about debating scripture, but the same Holy Spirit that regenerates each of us individually and personally is the same Holy, teach, Holy Spirit who's the teacher for us. So if you're going to build policy, and I think that there are two issues here, so I wanna delineate them out. Yeah. One is how we treat the person who deals with same-sex attraction. That's right. But by the same token, you have to look at the statutory language if you're pleading your case in court to say, where is the evidence here? So it doesn't mean that we treat anyone with malfeasance or disrespect or unkindness, nowhere in that book of deportment does it tell us we have the right to do that. But it does say truth and love, not truth or love. And sometimes in this postmodern conversation, the truth supersedes 
the, the love rather supersedes the truth and therein lies the rub. Now the public policy out there roaring in the culture is one thing, but our conversation is relegated to what we do inside the walls of the church. Yeah. So if we make this argument that it is indisputable based on what you just said, Michael, that a suitable helper can only be a man and a woman, by the same token, do we not have to say what was God's design for marriage? Was it just procreation? Was it just companionship? Or was that paradigm of one man and one woman meant to tell humankind something else about the very nature of God? Brandon. So I think what's important to recognize is that in the church, no matter what we come to believe about what the Bible says, and I'm, I'm happy to, I attend evangelical churches still, even though my theology is constantly shifting on this issue, but we need to be important about upholding the truth, whatever we believe the truth of the scripture to be on this issue, and let's just concede that the view that Michael Brown's articulating and that we're articulating here is the truth. That still, we still need to respond to the LGBTQ community in the church with love and grace, and what that looks like is not what the church has been doing. Okay, that wasn't my question. Yeah. You went right back to the affective. Sure. Let me pull you back to what I asked you before, yeah. which was, what was God trying to tell us when he made marriage as one man and one woman? Table for a moment, important as that conversation yeah. is, the way in which we treat people who deal with same-sex attraction. That is not a, never mind, we're not going to talk about it, but first principles, first yeah, steps. Sure. So why did God define marriage as one man and one woman? And what was he trying to tell us when he, the great king, created that model? Once again, I'm going to say that there are a number of different views in the Christian circle okay. on this issue. And so um, Matthew Vines or an affirming view would be that that was a patriarchal society. And so when God's speaking into the context of that society, he spoke in a way that they could understand it. And so for that time period, man and a woman was the standard. Now, I'm not saying whether I uphold that view or not because I'm still in flux on all of these issues, but I'm saying that there are other views that can be, other perspectives that can be articulated on these issues. Justin, do you want to weigh in on that? Well, so, um, first of all, I I would never presume to know the mind of God, so I I don't know how to answer a question on what did what was God wanting to say by creating marriage. Um, When I read Genesis, uh, what I see is that God says it's not good that Adam would be alone and God creates a helper suitable, I mean, as it says in the, in the text. Uh, marriage is certainly used um, as a, um, uh, an, an image of God, of Christ and the church uh, in scripture, uh, but, but it's also true that, uh, you know, uh, the monarchy is used as an image of God, but that doesn't mean that God requires everyone, you know, to live in a monarchy. Um, I think that marriage is incredibly important and valuable in, in society. And while Dr. Brown and I have some differences in interpretation of scripture, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with Brandon. He's the biblical scholar and I'm not. Uh, and so I'm, I'm perfectly willing for the sake of this conversation to say, uh, let's assume Dr. Brown is right in his interpretation of scripture. Then what does that mean for us as Christians? Um, so I, I should say just from the outset, I'm an evangelical. I believe as Christians we are required to uh, sacrifice our flesh to uh, Christ. That means that uh, whatever my uh, you know, uh, personal attractions or temptations may be, that ultimately it's my responsibility to uh, sacrifice that to Christ in every aspect of my life to find my identity not in my sexuality, but in Christ, not in my nationality, but in Christ. And growing up, my assumption was that the Bible uh, was clear in saying that being gay uh, was not only a a, a, a sin in terms of uh, that same-sex sexual activity was a sin, but that identifying as gay was sinful, that being gay was a choice. Um, uh, You know, I don't have time, obviously, to share my story. I've written a book called Torn that has my story in it. But uh, the short uh, uh, bit of it is that um, I I believed it was my responsibility as a Christian to speak out against folks who said they were gay. And yet, um, when I hit puberty and my guy friends were starting to be attracted to girls, I wasn't. I was having the opposite experience. And I thought over a period of many years that if I had enough faith and just trusted God, that those attractions would change, and and they never did. Uh, So to this day, I have no attractions for women. My attractions are for men. I'm not sexually active. I'm not uh, dating anybody. 
Um, those attractions for me are temptations in the same way that a heterosexual man who's not married has attractions. And forgive me for cutting you sure. off, but uh, everyone has a testimony, and I know there's so much more, and you've given the title of your book, and people will read it. I still can't get an answer to my question. And I want to go back to something you said. If you identified as yeah. an evangelical in who you are in Christ, why did you choose to call it the Gay Christian Network, as opposed to Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction? Yeah, that's really important. The word gay, I think, is important for um, a lot of reasons. And I think one of the things that's really significant is that the meaning of that word has changed. So I find that a lot of folks who grew up, say, before the Stonewall movement, who uh, were around uh, during that whole movement, associate the word gay with um, a sociopolitical identity. And they would say, to say I'm gay is to say, you know, my sexuality is at the core of my being, and so on and so forth. For millennials, and even folks in my generation, I'm not quite young enough to be a millennial like Brandon, um, the word gay has a different meaning. And the meaning of the word gay or straight uh, is a, about who you're attracted to. So in other words, uh, uh, the word gay is a shorthand way of saying a person who is attracted to the same sex and is not attracted to the opposite sex, which is a lot of words to stuff into that one word, gay. Uh, when someone in my generation asks, is that person gay? What they're asking is, is this person attracted to the same sex and not attracted to the opposite sex? If I say no, and they find out I am attracted to the same sex, I'm perceived to be lying. I think it's really important not to throw my fellow Christians, including folks like Wesley Hill and Ron Belgao and Eve Tushnet, who are committed to lifelong celibacy and say, this is a temptation, this is not my identity, but they use the word gay to describe themselves okay. as an adjective, right. not an identity. I think it's important for me to not throw them under the bus and say there's a difference between Anne's them and me. All right, so Anne, you were in the lifestyle. I was in the lifestyle. I became a Christian at 19, so right around your age. Yep. That was a long time ago, though. <laughs> oh, sad to say. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I, I, think, I think it's really important language, we would agree, I believe, is really important. The word gay can be interpreted in so many different ways. It can be interpreted as meaning affirming of homosexual behavior, as well as those who may struggle with same-sex attraction. So the, the latter would be simply something that defines the struggle as opposed to the identity or a behavior. And for me, the clarity is vital. Um, so our organization, Restored Hope, is, the, is one that seeks to help people reconciling their same-sex attraction to their faith and aligning it with the scripture as opposed to aligning it who knows where and under what interpretation. And so the vital thing for us as a network is to align it under the, the prohibitions of scripture and also the uh, indications of what human sexuality is meant for in scripture. So that's a really important thing for us. Um, and for me personally, and so I define myself as a Christian woman. I mean, that is who I am. Um, I did come out of homosexuality at 19 um, with the acceptance of Christ's all for my all. In other words, I traded my struggle, my sin, my shame for the amazing gift on the cross. And that uh, gift wiped away all my sin and uh, cleansed me. And just like 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 6, 11 says, beautifully, beautifully stated by Paul, um, did that mean that my attractions diminished immediately? Absolutely not. For about six months, yes. They went away <laughs> for other ones. But shortly after having that honeymoon period with God, honestly, uh, attractions reared their head again. I found myself intensely same-sex attracted again as, as, as I had been prior to accepting Christ. But as I began to walk through the things that were underlying same-sex attraction in my life, I began to find freedom from that. So I'm actually quite different now than I was at 19, 20, or even 25. But that was a process of surrendering my pain and my underlying sore, uh, hurts to the Lord to be able to be transformed. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's experience is like mine, no. clearly. Um, but in some cases, there is a lot of wounding underneath either uh, family relational issues or a number of other things, including uh, not bonding well with your same gender prior to puberty. I mean, that's actually pretty important. I'm raising three sons. 
they're all kind of the king of their crowd, right? I mean, they're the guys. They, they affiliate with other guys. Boys are the best before puberty in their mind. And girls, uh, they just, they're just, their, their voices are too high or they're whiny or whatever. They honestly, they couldn't stand girls prior to puberty. <laughs> and I saw a pattern there that their masculinity was so strong that they just felt like they were... Uh, they were buddies with those. So when puberty hit, they weren't naturally attracted to their same gender because they were just like them. And it became uh, an interest of them to connect with the opposite that they felt was their opposite, that they all of a sudden noticed, oh, girls, hmm, they're not so <laughs> terrible after all. <laughs> Michael, so. let me come back full circle again. Yeah. Because if we're going to decide policy in the church, we really do have to go back and say, what has God revealed Word told us? So, if I can, um, the wonderful thing about God is, yes, there are mysteries there, but God also makes himself plainly clear mm -hmm. on a multiplicity of issues, so that there really is no wiggle room for interpretation. There are majors and there are minors. We right. know that. So let me go back to the question I've asked that I have yet to get an answer to. Besides procreation and companionship, what was God trying to tell us when he created the model of marriage as one man and one woman? All right, and, and again, there's, there's no wiggle room in the Bible. There is zero evidence, zero evidence, I'll say it again, zero evidence that God intended a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman ever under any circumstance. Zero. There's not one shred of evidence that can be pointed to in explicit scripture. All the evidence, 100%, is that it created men for women, women for men. So that, that's clear. And that marriage, even, and even all the different forms it took, things that were not ideal, like polygamy and things like that, it was always male, female. So the only thing that existed, there was only one kind of air to breathe. And, and, and the whole idea that it was patriarchal, no, no, no. This is the way God created it. And, and if you're going to say that, well, there was patriarchal people writing it, then, then you're no longer evangelical. You're, you're no longer holding to any high view of scripture under, under any circumstance. And, and I just want to insert one little thing. I think it's amazing at 22 that you're doing what you're doing, that Time Magazine is quoting you, and that you're invited to sit on this panel. But since you said that your views are constantly changing, I would say that the better course of action is to do acts of compassion and love on people and reach out, but don't lead any movement and don't make any public statements and give yourself five, ten years until you know that you know that you know. Because I'm 100% sure that your views that you're espousing are, are mixed with serious, deadly error and that in your zeal, you're going to hurt a whole lot of people. So I, it's obvious God's hand is on you to, to do something and to be a leader. And, and, and again, where you are already is amazing. But I just want to caution you. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm around young people day and night in our ministry school. I, I just want to caution you that, that if you can't even answer some of these things black and white and if for the sake of debate you're willing to concede these issues, not the time to be leading a movement. Just, just... But I would answer answer to that is that I'm not leading a movement. Um, if you read everything that I write, I'm never espousing a theological view. My whole case is that the church would treat LGBTQ people with a more Christ-like compassion. Okay, well then we, we agree on that. So, so back to the point about, about marriage, and I just want to weigh in quick on the, the gay identity thing. If the image of God, we're all created in the image of God, every human being, and yet there's something expressed in male and female that each one is unique. In fact, as we read scripture, we see aspects of God that are male. He's identified as he and a warrior. And others, there's a tender, mothering side in God as expressed in scripture. That's fully expressed in the marriage, in the man and woman coming together. So there is, there is the, the role of the father, the husband, the protector, the provider. There is the, the woman who is the nurturer. She's Chava, she's Eve, she's the, the mother of all living. There is the sacrificial act of the, of the husband, the father, on behalf of the wife. There is the, the, the caring, the, the honoring. There's, there's certain things reflected, hence the analogy in Ephesians 5 of Christ in the church. There, there are many other things that come out of it, but as I've debated this on what, when I've been able to debate folks, once you redefine marriage, once you say it's no longer the union of a man and woman, it becomes anything. Uh, so the three guys in Thailand were, quote, married. They're an internet cessation. We had the lesbian thruffle in, in, in New England last year. Well, why not? If it's not a man and a woman, why two? Why not six? Why not like the, the women recently who've married themselves? 
Why not? Uh, and, and in England right now, overthrowing the Oxford English Dictionary in centuries of, of usage of language, a husband can now refer to a woman, a wife can refer to a man. If California law goes past in, in birth certificates, you can have a male mother and a female father. Everything becomes meaningless once you redefine the foundations. Chesterton, uh, G.K. Chesterton said, don't ever take down a fence until you know why it was put up. In the first place, what, exactly. What, when it comes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to gay identity, I understand Justin's perspective. I understand the communication issue. And I understand the sensitivity because you get a lot of people hurt. They leave church. They think God hates them. The church hates them. They, they go to Justin's website. They find love and acceptance. Maybe they come back to Jesus through that. I understand what he's doing. I would differ for two main reasons. First, there's the ideology in our society. We cannot uh, ignore the elephant in the room of gay activism. We cannot ignore it as the principal threat to religious freedom, speech, and conscience in America. We cannot ignore its attempt to redefine marriage and, and the agenda that's being pushed and all the stuff in media and everything else and kids watching Glee and so on and that's shaping their worldview of, of sexuality and life. And gay means something in our culture right. on a larger level. Yep. That's why I'll use the term for communication, but I differ on the identity issue. But here's the deeper thing. Uh, I, I saw comments uh, just this morning, someone sent me a link, is that the young man with you? I said, that's on the panel. Were you identified as queer, and you said that you could be sexually attracted in different directions. For all I care, you could be sexually attracted to a lampshade. That doesn't define you. Absolutely. It doesn't define who you are. So that's my concern. If you take away the gay liberation movement, gay activism, and simply have a compassionate, sensitive society that realize that some people, very deep to the core of their being, they feel they were born this way, deal with same-sex attraction or other attractions, or, or some with, with things that every one of us would reject, they're attracted to children, and, and it's really deep-seated in many human beings, how do we help them? Yeah. That, and, and as a child of God, that's not your identity. Your identity is a son right. of God, a, a follower of Jesus, a born again. And I want to pick up on that. Yeah. I want to pick up on that because, Brandon, you made the statement that you're not heading a movement, yet you founded something called the Revangelical Movement. And Michael yeah. referenced the Time Magazine article called Inside the Evangelical Fight Over Gay Marriage. So let me quote part of that. It says, uh, one of the goals of the Reformation Project is to, quote, raise up LGBT affirming voices in every evangelical church in the country. To reach that goal, training is being done for reformers in batches of 40 to 50 at regional leadership workshops who can go back to their home churches and serve as advocates for LGBT inclusion. The Reformation Project has staffers in three states, reps in 25 more, plans for a presence in all 50 states by 2018, and has a budget of $1.2 million in 2015, quote, from Time Magazine, with the help of furniture mogul Mitchell Gold, a secular Jew who is working toward evangelical change. Now, I'm from Washington. That sounds an awful lot like community organization and lobbying. Well, that's not my movement. That's Matthew Vine's movement. Right, but are you project. not a part of the Reformation Project? I'm not. Okay. Um, and the Revangelical movement is something I started while a student at Moody Bible Institute. It has nothing to do with the sexuality question and all to do about looking back at what it actually means to be an evangelical beyond the political identities that have been placed upon evangelicalism. And so that's what that's all about. But I'm not a part of the Reformation Project, right. and my work, Evangelicals for Marriage Equality, right. our statement is clear. We are not saying a theological position. We are saying that civil marriage equality is something we can support no matter what you come down to theologically. Okay, that I'm glad you brought up, because therein lies the rub, I think. Yep. So as a believer, that seems to be a spiritually schizophrenic position. So I don't support it in the church, but I can straddle it as long as we call it civil. No. Marriage wasn't defined by judges in Massachusetts, the Supreme Court of the United States in June, or the Congress of the United States. It was defined by God. Amen. I don't care what adjective you slap on the front, it is still marriage. So how then can you, as a person who's identified as an evangelical, advocate for something called civil marriage when it's two people of the same sex? I'm confused. Because what the government is doing is not marriage. Marriage is something that happens as a sacrament within the church. Only the church has the authority to marry people in the eyes of God. And so when the government is performing marriage, Marriage. we can even say so-called marriage, it's not marriage. And so it really becomes a matter of what words are being used. The government is using the word marriage, and they're not looking to change that word. We can fight for that. And oh, I but they are. They are looking to change that word. The That's word exactly marriage? the point. Absolutely. And by the way, for the record, the government at one point advocated slavery. 
This doesn't yeah. make it right. No, but absolutely. But as an American, we're guaranteed a life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in any way we choose. And so, yes, I as a Christian, I'm going, Christian and I'm going to advocate for what I think are the biblical views in the church. But on the government level, this is not a Christian nation. And you nation. don't see that as conflicting? So I don't. that the government can advocate one position, but the church advocates another. Because the another. government is not carrying out... The government is not the church. The government is not preaching the word of God. But isn't marriage a pre-political institution? It is, and that's why in the church, marriage is between a man and a woman. And Well, I, you know, here's something that is a benefit for being a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, one is that 30 years ago, 30 years ago, it was unheard of to even consider marriage meaning anything but Absolutely. male and female. Is that not right? Yes. So... It's only a modern issue. It is a current cultural issue, but it has never been something that has even be, been threatened before until in Hawaii, when my oldest now was, uh, oh goodness, that was 17 years ago, when Hawaii was the first one to consider gay marriage, redefining marriage as being uh, between two individuals, period. And Hawaii, which is astoundingly liberal and mostly democratic all the way through, voted it down in the, in the Senate and the, the House. That was, that was something amazing. And so have 37 other states where the citizens have had a chance to vote. And so I think um, having judicial fiat and redefining uh, marriage is substantial and significant. And I think, I think we can go with a more libertarian view in, the, in, in some senses, but historically, um, marriage in government has been defined as between one man and one woman yeah. throughout all the generations of the U.S. Yeah. and men, most and every other country up until recently. Justin, so, so um, it, it, let me say, I am, you know, my my work is not about uh, the the political side of this or or the definition of marriage. Uh, that said, I don't think that Brandon's position is schizophrenic. Uh, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, talking about divorce, says there's a clear distinction between marriage in the eyes of the state and marriage in the eyes of the church, and that they should be two completely different things. That people may be married in the eyes of the state or not married in the eyes of the state, but that does not determine whether or not they're married in the eyes of God, and that Christians ought to be very clear clear about differentiating those two. Uh, I agree with Lewis on this. Now, Lewis was writing about divorce and not same-sex marriage. I'm not suggesting Lewis would necessarily support same-sex marriage in the eyes of the state. But I don't see it as schizophrenic to say uh, that those are two separate things. Now, for me, the big question, though, is, uh, again, for the kid who grows up in the church and says, I am attracted to the same sex, not attracted to the opposite sex, and the only word they have for that is gay, some of us may say, well, maybe we don't think you should use that word, but that's the only word they have. They're looking for something to explain what's going on. Um, what we as a church have done far too often is the minute that kid in the church or the kid in our family says, I think I'm gay, what we do is we, we tell them either you must change your attractions or you're not welcome in this church, in this family. And there's a, a hugely disproportionate number of gay or LGBT uh, kids who are homeless on the street, who are from Christian homes, kids who are growing up in churches where they feel that they're not welcome and we haven't given them anything. And if we do welcome them, we think that because we're not saying anything negative to them, that we're supporting them. But what we do is we spend 90% of our time arguing about how we define marriage and about sexual morality. Now, these are two really important questions for us as Christians. Obviously, the definition of marriage in our society is changing. A lot of people are concerned about that. Obviously, uh, what we believe about sexual morality is changing. A lot of people are concerned about that. I'm not saying stop talking about those. But we spend 90% of our time talking about that and we don't spend much of any time talking about, okay, if we're asking this person to be celibate for the rest of their life, if their attractions don't change, what support are we giving them in being celibate? For that matter, what support are we giving our single straight folks who never meet the right person in being celibate? In many churches, if you're single and you're my age, the only, there may be a singles class, but it's focused on trying to help right. you meet your partner. So let me pick up on that because you talk about side A and side B. I want to hear about that. Sure. But I want to go back to that individual. Let's take that stereotypical person who says to someone in the church, I am struggling with same-sex attraction. What is the biblical responsibility of the church to that person? Well, so... Obviously, that depends, first of all, on uh, what we believe the Bible says about same-sex uh, relationships. Funny and, uh, how that takes us yeah. right back again, isn't <laughs> so, it? So, two pieces, though. What does it say about same-sex sex, 
but also what does it say about same-sex committed relationships that may be non-sexual? So, for instance, I might ask the question, um, what does the Bible have to say, if we, if we accept uh, Dr. Brown's position, which I think he's made very clear, uh, that uh, same-sex sexual behavior is forbidden always in Scripture. Do you believe Can, that? So, like I said, my... <laughs> I have, right. so I, I have, no, 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 so, 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 so let me say, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been open about the fact that my view on that has changed. I used to very strongly agree with Dr. Brown, I don't agree with him anymore, but I also realize that in this room, my position is the extreme, extreme minority on that. It is not what my ministry does. I oversee a ministry where many people would agree with Dr. Brown on that, and so uh, I'm very clear that I'm not a biblical scholar. I don't want anyone to change their position because of anything I say, and so I choose uh, not to to debate that. Okay, so let me challenge that, though, yeah. because I, I, I so appreciate the sincerity. But again, you're ahead of an organization called the Gay Christian Network, and to go back to the Pauline wisdom offered yeah. by Dr. Brown, you're heading a movement where people have two different camps. Yeah. That's like saying, I'm an anti-slavery camp, but we have people who own slaves. It's okay. How no. do you do that? No, 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 because we, because we, we did, like, like I said, folks in my generation use the word gay as shorthand for someone who is attracted to the same sex and not attracted to the opposite sex. Yes. Um, so when I say, the, 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 we started as a tiny little online group of Christians, many of whom were committed to lifelong celibacy, who said, look, my identity is not in my sexuality. This is an adjective. You know, I, uh, somebody asked me the other day, um, well, why would you say gay Christian? It sounds like you're talking about a kind of Christian. And I say, no, absolutely not. Uh, I don't go around referring to myself as a gay Christian. I go around referring to myself as a Christian. Right. And I who happens that. to but be gay. In deference to time, let me go back to the question I yeah. asked you, which is we explain, you explained the name beautifully, why you call it the Gay Christian Network. But I go back to the stereotypical, hypothetical 19-year-old who says I'm struggling with same-sex attraction. Right. You made the declaration that your position has evolved. So I asked, what is the responsibility biblically of the church for that person who struggles with same-sex attraction? Your position is evolving, so what would you do? What's the, hypo how, what's the church's response? Every church then, wherever they are in this evolution of position, counsels as they see fit? That is spiritual schizophrenia. Well, no, so, so what I would say is if you say to me, look, uh, I, I, we believe that the Bible is really clear in uh, condemning same-sex sexual behavior, then I say, fine. So the question then for the church is, if we believe that the Bible condemns same-sex sexual behavior, um, how do we support this person in celibacy? Is there a way for them to have some kind of committed uh, partnership that is non-sexual that would be appropriate within biblical boundaries? What would that look like if so? If not, then if they need to live their life alone, what does that look like? And where do we give them support? One of the things that I've talked about often is the fact that my mom passed away a year and a half ago of a terrible brain disease. She was sick for eight years. My mom was cared for for those eight years by my dad. Um, my parents had a wonderful, beautiful marriage. I love them both. Had my mom not been married, she would not have survived those eight years. And I, this is a potentially genetic disease. And so for me, the question isn't, this is not about wanting to fulfill my flesh. This is about, for me, if I have the same disease as my mom, what happens to me? Who takes right. care of and me? And I'm going to stop you there because you've segued again into the empathetic argument. And that's the challenge for the... Wait, if I can. I'm talking about we start with the straight stick of truth and work from there, not start with the empathetic argument and work backwards. But so, isn't that what Jesus did? No, he did not. He absolutely when, told us when, what the but law when Jesus said. says. when Jesus says, for instance... No, this, I'm going to stop you there and I'm going to go to Brandon. Okay. Brandon, is your position evolving on same-sex marriage or do you believe that the Bible allows for same-sex marriage? I think my position is evolving, and we've kind of already clarified that, but what we do in the church is important. Is the, the Bible, has your position changed, and do you believe the Bible allows for same-sex marriage? I don't know, but... Okay. And I've never said that I know that answer. 
My passion for why I'm doing what I'm doing is because while a student at Moody Bible Institute, I met tons of LGBT Christians who are struggling with their sexuality in the halls of the dorms and in churches around Chicago, and they were struggling with suicide and had mental issues and psychological damage because the church had harmed them so terribly because what we did with the straight stick of truth was to beat them and exclude them and to harm them instead of to say, we're speaking the truth to you in love. Okay, and, and that's I'm going I'm... to turn to you. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If uh, one, someone comes up to you and they say, and I'm going to make the declaration that I believe the Bible is unambiguous about same-sex relations, so I will posit my question based on that. So if someone is struggling with some other activity that the Bible calls sin. Let's say that the person happens to be struggling with a drug addiction. Out of compassion, does the church supply them with clean needles to facilitate their struggle, or do we lovingly take them in and say, Jesus has a better plan for your life? Exactly. I think that the key here, the direction that we have to go in is what is the clear witness of nature and of scripture? And both go along together. Um, just the physique, the, the biological aspect of life confirms scripture and God's point. And of course, that reflects the very heart of God for our redemption in Jesus Christ as the bridegroom giving himself away for the bride, the church. Um, Honestly, when someone comes with same-sex attraction, the church should be the first one to put their arm around that individual. I agree with that. Agreed. Um, and, the f and the first one to say, you know what, this is not God's plan for your life. Um, just as if someone who's heterosexual is not yet married, is not free to go and, and have sex with whomever, the scripture is clear for the purpose of sexuality. That individual is also committed to celibacy until married. I mean, that is the witness of scripture. Um, so, submission is important. Now, the church can, of course, enable others to participate in sin, and that would be supplying the needles and supplying the uh, other devices in order to encourage such behavior. What we have to do is look at scripture, what does that uh, define as being acceptable behavior, and then align ourselves with how to provide the care, both the love and the truth uh, that comes along with that. And that's what I encourage parents to do as well, honestly embrace, love your child, don't send them away, don't do that, but you don't have to also give up truth in order to do so. So Michael, th again, we started this out by saying it was a war of words, so here we are again. So is there a distinction to be made between loving and affirming? Yeah, absolutely. Jesus practiced transformational inclusion, not affirmational inclusion. He reached people where they were and he changed them. When he hung out with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, he didn't teach them how to apply their trade and make more money. He met them where they were, right? And then he transformed them. When I was shooting heroin at the age of 16 and got saved in 71, God reached out to me in my sin, showed me Jesus died for me in my sin, unconditional love expressed to me, and then called me out of that. My testimony is not, I've been shooting heroin for 43 years and God is so merciful. I said he transformed my life. Now, now just, just a, a couple of quick comments. It's absolutely schizophrenic to say that we support marriage in a civil sense even though we're not making a biblical statement because words are words and we all know that they convey meanings. My friend Dr. Frank Turek has often pointed out that the, the law can prohibit, it can permit, or it can promote. When you change words, you change meanings, you change definitions in society. Mm -hmm. and, and even for gay activists, a civil marriage was always just a step uh, to, to the next ultimate goal. And gay activists have said if we redefine marriage, 90% of our goals are already won. So we have to understand that here's the tension now. We see what's happening in society, right? Uh, there's going to be a vote in a state over, over redefining marriage. A lot of good that does right now to, to vote when judges overturn it, but we're, we're going to vote. Okay, it's important to us. There's a bill in Charlotte. When I get back home, I'm going to be speaking at a rally. We're concerned about the direction of this bill and the so-called bathroom bill, that, that aspect of it. On the other hand, we've got someone in, the, in our church, whenever I'm giving a presentation, in my mind, I'm thinking someone in the front row is struggling with same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. Someone in the back, their kid has just come out and said I'm gay. Yeah. Uh, someone else that just committed suicide. I want to be thinking about them 
And the philosophy I've operated under the last 10 years is reach out and resist. Reach out to the That's people great. with compassion, resist the agenda with courage. It's a certain tension that I live with because I understand when I'm speaking up on the definition of marriage that that lesbian couple there just feels I rejected them and I don't recognize their relationship. So I, I'm all for... Justin's approach of using a word because of the way it's used. That's why I'll use the word gay. Some say, say, don't even use it. That's giving legitimacy. I'm using it to try to reach and communicate. But what I would then do is actively disciple people out of that mentality. In, in other words, the, they, they came to the network because they heard the word gay, but now they understand that's not who I am. Because we wouldn't do that with anything else that is fundamentally a part of someone's nature that we recognize is not what God intended. So the church's response is absolute clarity on what scripture teaches, because I hear from the people that came out of homosexuality, whether their, their attractions changed or not, they came out of it, and they can, they're free from suicide, and they're free from depression, and so we hear all of that. And, and I, 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 during the civil rights movement, I don't remember hearing about black youth killing themselves because of the rejection they suffered. Yes, the rejection is very real, that, that gay kids, to, to use that term, experience. Yes, the sense of people hate me, parents misunderstanding. I, I don't hear the horror stories as much as Justin, but I hear them too. Uh, people call my radio show and tell me these things, and I counsel in terms of how to approach properly. But there's also something in our society that puts out this message. Uh, Mitchell Gold himself, that, that, that helps with, uh, with the Reformation Project, he got on on my radio show and said, if you vote for marriage, if you vote for the marriage amendment, gay kids will jump off bridges. What kind of message is that? To say they're going to be killing themselves if you stand for marriage. What we need to say is nobody needs to be killing themselves. If you give your life to God, there's hope. The message of Jesus is a message of life and liberation, and it will deliver from suicide. And then we tell parents, your kid comes out as gay, you say, look, you know where we stand scripturally. We love you. You're our kid. You're always going to be our kid. We are your parents. We are involved in your life, and we are going to be involved in your life. And if you're struggling, you're hurting, you call us. And the church, just like it has provisions for widows and things like that, those who are, who are called to celibacy or gifted with celibacy or simply feel that's, that's where they have to go, the church absolutely needs to do better on that. And we need to say, okay, marriage is under assault. Marriage is deteriorating. The reason churches are debating this is really simple. It's not because the Bible's ambiguous. It's because we've been departing from the authority of Scripture for a while. We need to say, okay, on the one hand, build up marriage, build up family, teach that. That's the, the large norm. On the other hand, get God's mind and heart for singles. Get God's mind and heart for celibates. Listen to the horror stories. I, Justin knows that I differ with his assessment of scripture in his book and with his assessment of, quote, ex-gay therapy in his book. But I think it's important to read my book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? I start off quoting him to say, you need to understand the struggle. You need to put yourself in those people's shoes. But don't now make the mistake of what Jesus warned about. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I've seen people do that. I've seen people say, look, I'm not sure what the Bible says, but I'm sure that I'm gay. And now they end up terp- interpreting the Bible through the lens of their sexuality. Or, or you interpret the Bible through the lens of your love for a kid. True love is going to be mixed with biblical truth. The two must go hand in hand. Right. Justin, like you're yourself. taking notes like you're at a White House briefing. You're next. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, here's, here's the thing, because for all of our, our disagreements, Michael and I had a really nice conversation last night, and we disagree on a lot of things, but we agree on a lot of things. We agree that we need to look to Scripture first. We agree that we need to um, show compassion to people. Uh, we agree that the, the church has not always handled this as well as we could. Uh, and we agree that there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of folks out there in the LGBT world who use suicide as a, as a threat against every little thing that they that they disagree with, and that that's wrong. Um, so uh, you know, I um, I mean, one point that I wanted to make, though, you know, when you said, well, you know, I didn't I didn't hear uh, uh, about uh, you know black kids uh, committing suicide in the middle of you know black kids were not being disowned by their parents because of being black. And that's one of the differences is when you're a gay kid, you grow up and you realize that you're gay before you've even had time to think about whether or not that's a word you want to use or whatnot. Just admitting this is what I feel in many Christian homes, sadly, means that you get disowned. Mm -hmm. Um, You get treated like 
like you've made a choice. And this is part of what the church has not done well, is we treat people as if they've made a sinful choice when they, all they've done is to try to be honest about what they're going through. And that's where we need to stop mm-hmm. and say, let me love this person where yes. they are. That's right. Um, and that's, so and that's we, something let, I let think... Let me stop we, at that point, because yeah. I think it's hugely yeah. important. So can all four of us say there is a point of agreement? Absolutely. Yes. All right. Absolutely. So that's a takeaway from today, no matter what, that the that's church right. needs to do a better job of teaching mom and dad how to love their child regardless yes. of whatever sin struggle they're engaged in. And I think Amen. one other piece... Yeah. One other piece I want to be clear about, and this is a language difference, and part of why I know I seem like a broken record talking about language, and you you get sick of it, but part of why I talk about it so much is that it's been common uh, in in what's been called the XK movement in the past, and um, in certain Christian circles, to use phrases like coming out of homosexuality. You know, Anne uses it, Michael uses it. I don't like that phrase, and I'll tell you why. Uh, What usually is meant by coming out of homosexuality is I used to be engaging in same-sex sexual behavior, and now I'm not. What a lot of folks out there hear when someone says coming out of homosexuality is that I'm no longer uh, gay. And this is where the the rub comes in about, well, what does gay mean? Is it sexual active or not? And so for me, growing up as a kid who was not sexually active, had no plans to be sexually active, was not romantically attached to anybody, but said, I'm attracted to the same sex, people kept pointing me to stories of folks who said, I've come out of homosexuality and saying, this person did, so you can too. And I'm saying, I don't have anything to come out of. And this is why I say gay and not homosexual. Because for me, homosexual says sexual activity, you know, and gay is saying this is my attraction, but it's not my identity. Good point. Now, Anne, you have to respond to that. I I do have to respond to that. I appreciate so much for you that you brought this up. I think it's really important. Um, And you're right. Not everybody has been involved in same-sex behavior, um, but they're dealing with same-sex attraction, and I think that's vitally different. But I think it's also important not to use the ambiguous term, and it is ambiguous to use the term gay, mm-hmm. to define a narrow view that they're not engaging in homosexuality. So I think it's important. I think when teenagers are discovering attraction to their same gender, they will probably use the term gay. Of course they would. I would have. I did. <laughs> But that didn't mean I was engaging in the behavior therein. So I think the most important thing that I would love for us to take away is ask a secondary question. Ask a defining question. So son, so daughter, so attendee to the church, are you saying that you're engaging in this or are you attracted to members of your same gender? Mm -hmm. If you are finding that you are attracted to members of your same gender, well, let's talk about that. But don't assume that they're acting upon those feelings. I think it's vital to know the difference. And, um, and I think that we've failed in that area, but we've, you know, there's, there's lots of good points of clarity. So let me pick up on that, because I think that was beautifully stated. And that's why, Justin and Brandon, the second part, and part of the questioning that I asked you was, if we talk about the difference between orientation and behavior, and what I just heard you say is that there is a distinction there, and the church needs to recognize that. Is it not then dangerous to promulgate the idea that it's okay because the Bible says as long as it's in a monogamous, affirming relationship, it's all right? The difference between that is a chasm bigger than the Grand Canyon, is it not? We can say here we know that you're struggling, maybe just in your heart. You haven't acted on it yet. But if we open that door and say, but as long as it's a monogamous, this is your side B, as long as it's monogamous, it's side A. A. Sorry, I get the sides mixed up, A, B. (laughs) That as long as it's monogamous, it's okay. It, there is where I think we see the river part dramatically in the church. Do we not? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's there's no question that th- th- these terms side A and side B come from a group called Bridges Across the Divide, and they said side A says monogamous same-sex relationships are okay. Side B says no, ma- male and female only. Um, Absolutely. If if the Bible is side B, then that of course means it's side A is promoting something sinful and wrong and and harmful. Uh, and likewise, you know, side A would say, well, if side A is right, then side B is putting people back under the law. Right. And you know, you know, there's no question that this is a huge chasm. We can't just say, oh well, it doesn't matter. Let's just agree to disagree because this is a huge, huge uh, question. I think one of the reasons that uh, side A is gaining ground in the church. People say, well, it's just the church capitulating to culture. I think it's more than that. I think one of the problems is that side B, the traditional view in the church, has so often failed to offer an alternative. 
What we've given people is what Eve Tushnet, who is celibate, has referred to as a vocation of no. People say, well, um, I'm same-sex attracted, I'm gay, you know, whatever words they use. What should I do? And what we tell them is, what you should do is to not have sex. But we haven't said, here's what a fulfilling, if you never become attracted to the opposite sex. We, you know, we, we're happy to hold up stories of those who had a, a change in their attractions as, as Anne did and, 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 you know, found a heterosexual marriage. But for those who don't experience that, we haven't said, here's what a happy, fulfilling life looks like as a celibate Christian who's actively involved in the church. We tend to be fairly suspicious in many evangelical churches of single people past a certain right, age. So let me pick up on that because yeah. it's hugely important. Isn't celibate the understood position for every non-married, Bible-believing, born-again Christian? Absolutely. It ought to be. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, th and that's why I say this isn't just about gay folks. This is about the, the heterosexually attracted single person who just never finds the right person. Exactly. Um, often, and I've heard this from countless single people in evangelical churches, they say, you know, once you get past a certain age and you're not married, people start looking at you funny. And they don't want you to be a pastor and they don't want you to be in leadership and they don't want you to do this or that because they're suspicious. Right. And we haven't really given people, we talk so much about how important marriage is, and it is, and how important family life is, and it is, but for those who are single, we haven't often done a very good job of giving them a, a picture of what does it look like to be a, a single celibate Christian. Would you separate out people with same-sex attraction who are single from people who have heterosexual attractions and are single? Or would you say they are both unmarried and under the canopy of celibacy and in obedience to God, we work with them together? Or do you still yeah. continue to factor out based on their orientation? No, I think orientation is a factor in that um, it, it, it affects, you know, for me, even though I'm single and I'm not sexually active, the fact that I'm gay or whatever word you want to use has affected what it's like for me growing up in the church because of the things that I hear, the things people say and all that. But in terms of how I live, it's the same. It's the same as if my attractions were for women. I'm not married. Therefore, you know, there are certain guidelines for how I should live. And I think... I could go that direction, but I would like to go with one that he mentioned just a minute ago, and that was essentially, what do you do if you're side B, for example? You are same-sex attracted, you're single, and you believe you cannot act on same-sex attraction. There's a whole movement in the church, actually, considering itself evangelical, that you're looking for a non-sexual marital partner. And honestly, when you look at, and that's very dangerous, uh, because we would call that, um, you know, pseudo marriage essentially is what I would, what I personally would call it. Um, there are these individuals that hold the viewpoint are rising rapidly in theological seminaries uh, around the country and, and in Europe as well, by the way. Evangelical seminaries, mainline denominational seminaries. So I think it's very important for us to consider what is the role of somebody who's single? How do they find an answer to loneliness? And honestly, as a single woman now, because my marriage fell apart and my husband went back into the gay lifestyle, um, I, I am now someone who's also in that situation. I'm single and I'm, my, my sexuality is committed to Christ. I'm following after him. What do I do? Well, I do what everybody else does on the face of the earth, and that is I invest in my friendships. Want not one single person to mimic a, a marital relationship, that I find to be a problematic, honestly. I do. I find that to be problematic. Uh, but instead, I'm invested in a community of women. I actually have fellowship with very close friends and a multitude of them, of women, and I identify with them and they identify with me. They actually help round out my life and most of my closest friends, not one of them in my local area is from a gay background. And they find, do not find that to be problematic for them to embrace me as a woman. So I think that, I think that in the church, there can be very close friendships uh, that do not mimic marriage, but that are intimate and rich and deep, just like, um, just like many relationships that people have. Brandon. I'd say I agree with everything you just said. I think, however, in the church, we treat the gay issues, um, in particular for gay men in the church who are struggling with same-sex attraction, almost as if they have the plague. And so even in my Bible college context, when I came out to certain friends and told them about my struggle, um, 
there were responses like, well, I wouldn't have been your roommate if I would have known that. And so what that does is it makes that whole friendship thing um, very difficult in the church, and we marginalize and exclude those of us who have this question about our sexuality, and then that does lead us to things like depression and anxiety. Um, my moody experience ended up in the hospital three times for massive anxiety attacks because this exclusion that continued happening. And we need to figure out a better way to do this. We need to figure out a better way to teach our congregants how to respond to this, that this isn't a plague issue, that they're not unclean because we struggle with our I'm going to come to you, Michael, but in defense of Moody, if I can, do you think Moody would have a boy and a girl room together? Oh, absolutely not. Why? Sexual Clearly, tension? yeah, absolutely. So if someone says declaratively, I have same-sex attraction, do you think it's illogical or uncompassionate to say there's potential for tension here? But then what do you do with them? Exactly. What do you do with that? That's the question ah, we need to ask. So here, here's Michael. the key. Here's it's the key. It's difficult. It, it, and, and I don't want to oversimplify, but here's the key. We are fighting in culture gay activism. <clears throat> From the gay perspective, liberty, equality, same rights as everyone else. I understand the perspective, but from our perspective, it's a culture war that came knocking at our door, okay? Now, I also have Matthew Vine's doing what he's doing, you're doing what you're doing, you're doing what you're doing. Now there's the onslaught within the church. Even though I understand you're not espousing a definite position because you do have both sides, that means that that's part of your network. You're not excluding side A. So if you would work with us to uphold what Scripture said and be black and white on what the Bible said. Now, obviously, you're not there, okay, in terms of your viewpoint. But if you were, we could all work together to address these problems. But as it is, we're fending off every type of liberal attack, every type of gay activist attack, every type of compromised evangelical attack, assault on scripture, the meaning of marriage, and on and on, so that it's difficult now, because in that sense, we're put on the defensive constantly to now do all the constructive things. So first big error. The gospel we preach in America is one of spiritual empowerment. Jesus died to make you into a bigger and better you to fulfill your dreams. The American gospel starts with, this is who I am, this is how I feel, God is here to please me. The biblical gospel starts with, this is who God is, this is how he feels, we are here to please him. When you start there, as, as Sam Albury said, same-sex same attracted pastor living a holy life in England, he said when people hear about his situation, they say, oh, it must be so much harder for you because no, Jesus requires everything from all of us That's right. and Jesus is enough. So let's start with the fact that our brothers and sisters are being beheaded and buried alive and sold into slavery right now. Whatever is asked of us, even lifelong celibacy, which I can't imagine, I'm married almost 39 years now, but whatever it is, is, is not that. And yet we all sign up for that. My life for the gospel, I now belong to the Lord. So we start, and if it's, if it's going to be difficult, no one promised us an easy road. God never promised a heterosexual marriage if you follow Jesus. So we start there, we make real disciples, and it's amazing, as we work with quality people around the world, they're not asking what's in it for me. And when they're sent out on a mission, if they never come back, Hey, Brother Andrew said, our Lord said, go. He said nothing about coming back. So we start there, right? And, and, and then the next thing is, with these sensitivities, with these very real struggles, not criticizing a kid that grew up watching MTV reality shows in Glee and with 13-year-olds with sexting each other on their cell phones, saying, okay, that's where they're at. How can we then bring them to the Lord and make real disciples? And a quick testimony. Sorry. Our church has been on the front lines of standing for social righteousness, pro-life, fighting against human trafficking, standing for marriage and family. And yet when a gay protest came to our building a few years ago, the protesters left in 15 minutes. They apologized. The, the protester called my show the next day to apologize and said, we met with the perfect love of God. Mm -hmm. So Amen. you can tell people that. If, if, if we've had students in, in our ministry school that have shared, hey, I'm struggling with same-sex attraction in my mid-20s. We love them all the more. In other words, that to me is the signal, right. get more right. involved in their right. lives. And, right. and again, if, if we could work together on the other points, because I joyfully work together to say, okay, how can we recover the holy call of celibacy? And how can we also make room for the transforming power of the gospel? Right. And how can we recover these things? But when there's the constant battle, and I don't mean you guys are combative, I just mean we're in these ideological, scriptural battles, and exactly. it's very difficult to work together for common good. Well, and that's why I wanted to draw the distinction between the howling winds of what's going on in the culture and what we're doing in the church. And clearly we have some work to do here. So that takes me to you, Brandon, which yep. is, and, and I 
know that you made the declaration you're not a part of the Reformation Project, but with hired guns, they're trying to come into the church and to change the church's thinking on this, which is like asking God, did you change your mind and let us re-help you write that passage? June, the decision's going to come down from the high court. A couple of questions for you. Does the church have a stake in this decision? Honestly, because I think there's a separation between sacred and civil, whatever the Supreme Court says doesn't affect what the church says and what God has said. And so the church will continue to perform the sacrament of marriage like we always have. Right. And the government will do what the government does. So you absolutely stand with me in agreement that the mayor of Houston was dead wrong in absolutely. asking for the pastor's sermons. I wrote an article in Huffington Post saying it was Excellent. wrong. Excellent. Excellent. Yep. Terrific. All right. So then why, if, uh, if we see this change that's going on, shouldn't, and I bet you learned this at Moody, shouldn't the church have more of an influence on the world than the world has an influence on the church. I would say yes and amen. Okay, so then how do you straddle the two worlds between advancing one view of marriage here and supporting another view of marriage there? It's not, I'm not working to advance a view of marriage. I'm simply saying that in our culture, the church needs to make a distinction and say we're going to fend for the kingdom of God and we're going to allow the kingdom of the world to do what the kingdom of the world does because that's what's going to happen. And we're going to continue to preach the gospel into the kingdom of this world and not fight over these political issues, but lift up the cross instead. Now, and I, if I can, just before you go on to that, yeah. and I so appreciate that answer. Yeah. So as a brother in the Lord, is it hard for you to try to say that you understand what scripture says, but then, and it's called evangelicals for equality, so yeah. there's an advocacy aspect yeah. for that. Is it hard for you to advocate for a position that the Bible says is not there? That has to be difficult for you at one hand. I believe that the Bible does make this distinction, though, between rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God's what is God's. And I'm an advocate for let's make the kingdom of God stronger, let's preach the gospel into the culture, but let's not try to Christianize the culture, because that's not what we're called to. That's not what Christ called us to do. You can't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, exactly. But again, and I'm having a difficult time grasping this, Brandon, and I want you to teach me. I don't understand, and I hear the, the distinction that you're making, but we're called to influence and occupy, to let our light so shine, to, to be a city on a hill, all of those wonderful directions, and uh, the call to be an ambassador for Christ. So I don't know, even if you see that there is a distinction there, which apparently there is, by the way, last time I checked, a screen door in that wall of separation, because <laughs> the church come, gets invaded by the government on a fairly sure, regular basis. Absolutely. But how do you advocate for a relationship that God defined on the one hand and yet protect and defend the relationship as God defined it on the other? Because once again, Jesus in his context lived in a government that was opposed to the gospel, but Jesus wasn't marching up to the palace of Caesar and trying to get Caesar to change the laws. He was preaching the subversive gospel and as more hearts are affected with the gospel, the laws will eventually change. So our call is let's get out to the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Let's get people into the kingdom of God and then the laws will change, but we can't do it the other way. So, but what Jesus didn't do is say and really support the bondage that Caesar puts in place. He said, I've set you free. So what happens when the messages are mutually exclusive? So but he, the problem is we get down to all of us here uphold the Constitution. We think that there's something valuable about that. And there is a sense that in a non-Christian country, everybody has the right to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, whatever way they choose, as long as it doesn't impinge upon my rights. Two brothers? Two brothers? Do they have the right? No. Well, why not? Because, well, and I have a full definition here, but there's, John Corvino has a great argument about incest, polygamy, two brothers. But he's wrong. He's been proven wrong on it. Incest is being said. Here, I, did a, I was part of a debate yeah. on consensual adult incest. I was asked by a debate out, a new website. They had a professor, a psychologist, five different people. I was the only one out of the five saying that, that we should not allow consensual adult incest. Four out of the other five. The, the whole thing, there is no slippery slope. We're 98% down the avalanche already, and, and to say there's no slippery slope. John Corvino's already... I but mean, the slippery slope goes in both directions, because in the societies where things like polygamy and incest are practiced, homosexuality is most condemned. And so right now, in a country that doesn't advocate, that isn't having national gay marriage, we have incest and polygamy happening in places like Utah. We have TLC shows right, devoted right, exactly. to polygamy. The same media, this is all part, this is the slippery slope is one direction in this case. It is all part of the sexual revolution. What we need to understand is, is the whole advocacy of homosexuality, the whole embracing of this. The same media is celebrating that, now celebrates polygamy, now celebrates incest, now celebrates polyamory. This is not part of the civil rights movement. This is part of the sexual revolution. That's how we have to see it. And look, we have a role. This is different than under Caesar's Rome. We have a role. We don't want to be like Hezekiah and saying, praise the Lord, I'm okay, even if my kids suffer. We have a role to the next generation. And, we, and look, we, we cannot take over society. We're not talking about a theocracy. 
but we do have an influence. The civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, these were people who came out of the church with a prophetic message. The abolition movement, these were people who came out of the church. People can rightly say to us, what were you doing when marriage was redefined? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the other thing to remember is that gay activists will not be satisfied with a religious exemption. Gay activists will not be satisfied until we in our businesses and even in the churches support redefining marriage. So, no, we, we're not taking over the society, but you better believe these things overlap. And the only reason government gets involved with marriage is because marriage plays right into government. It bestows benefits on marriage because marriage bestows benefits on society. And therefore, uh, government's involved. They overlap too much. We deceive ourselves if we think we just separate them. And on that, we put an exclamation point. <laughs> Who ever thought we'd be having this conversation, right? Would you thank our very esteemed panel? So good. So good to talk to you. Talk to you. And let me just put a capstone on this by saying, God in his mercy and sovereignty has called us for such a time as this. The directive has been and always will be truth and love, not truth or love that is required of muscular, mature Christians, and may God make us so. And even so, come Lord Jesus. Thanks so very much. Amen.